Hello, I'm Paul Olson, the Provost at the University of Jamestown, and I'm joined today by Dr. Stephen Reed, Professor of Religion and Philosophy here at UJ. Dr. Reed has been a faculty member at the university since 1997 and is an expert on the Dead Sea Scrolls. He spent his fall semester at the University of Agder in Norway, continuing his research on the scrolls and working with an interdisciplinary team of scholars from around the world. We're here today to learn a little bit more about his research. Dr. Reed, thank you for joining me today. Nice to be with you. Because everyone watching might not know what they are, could you tell us a little bit about uh, how the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered and uh, what they are? Now, there are two different ways of thinking about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Some people think they were only found at Qumran, and others think that there were a number of sites up and down near the Dead Sea where they were found. So the Dead Sea is, is situated in Israel. It's one of the lowest places on earth, and uh, the water is very salty there. And near the Dead Sea, there are a lot of limestone caves up and down. So it's a fairly desolate place, and there aren't many people living there. Um, so the Dead Sea Scrolls were first found probably in 1946 or 1947. We're not quite certain because uh, Bedouin, who are nomadic peoples living in that area, uh, basically uh, herding sheep and goats, brought those, brought some scrolls that they found from caves there uh, to Jerusalem and uh, showed them to various people to try to see what they were and if they had any value. Um, it turned out uh, they were of great value. Uh, the first, uh, there were seven that were scrolls that were fairly entire, complete scrolls. Scholars think they eventually came from Cave One at Qumran. Um, they would eventually find 11 different caves at Qumran that had different written material on them. Many of the caves had very fragmentary. Uh, they still called Dead Sea Scrolls, but they ought to perhaps be called the Dead Sea Scroll Fragments because most, most of the scrolls were not complete, very few, and a lot of them. Um, and there were also other sites that they found text basically from 1946 to about 1963. Uh, they found text uh, all the way uh, up Jericho in the north, which is north of the Dead Sea, and then all the way down to Masada, which is about halfway down the Dead Sea. In some cases, archaeologists like Yagao Yadin excavated that Masada, so all those materials were found by archaeologists. Uh, there are other sites, uh, Murabaat, Wahalhever, Nahalhever, uh, and Kerbet Murd, that there were also texts that were found. Uh, all of those texts were part they were located on the West Bank. So at that point, before 1946, there was not a state of Israel yet. They were deposited in a museum called the Palestine Archaeological Museum, uh, which is subsequently named, named the Rockefeller Museum because David Rockefeller provided the money for that museum. Um, the Israelis were in West Jerusalem and they acquired these seven scrolls and also did some excavation. So there were some materials that were found that ended up in the Shrine of the Book in West Jerusalem. Um, I actually, uh, I was interested in cataloging all of these materials from all these different sites that were found at the museum as well as the, at the Shrine of the Book. And I don't know, what, did I answer your question? So that these are, these are scrolls. Uh, most of them were written in Hebrew or Aramaic, some Greek, uh, but every, every site had, had its own kind of peculiar characteristics. One of, the says, one of the sites at Qumran had only Greek text in it, mm -hmm. so it varied. Okay. Yeah. When, when were the scrolls mostly written, and who is usually considered to be the authors of the scrolls? Most of the scrolls seem to, at, at, if we look at, at Qumran, probably the oldest ones seem to have been written about 250 before, years before Christ, and the latest ones about A.D. 70 or so. Okay. Um, and traditionally, it was thought that a group of Jews called the Essenes were largely the ones that wrote those texts. That's probably not entirely accurate because 
many of the texts were brought in from outside by other people. So we don't really know where they were written. We, we know where they were found, uh, but we don't really know where they were written. There seemed to have been, uh, uh, at Qumran, they've excavated it, and people were living there. And so one theory is that it was a rather sectarian group living there, uh, and that they deposited the texts in the caves. But it still is a debated issue. Now, other caves, sometimes, uh, like during the Second Jewish Revolt, 132 to 135, Jews were escaping the, the conflict and war, and they went out into the wilderness, and they hid uh, text in caves. So in some cases, they were private archives. We have a woman named Babatha, who had a collection of her contracts to uh, orchards and a marriage contract and things like that. So there are different reasons. Okay. So for us today, what is the historical significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls for, for Christians, for Jews, and for other people who are really interested in the Bible today? Well, one of the most important things was that these texts were written such a long time ago. So most of them are at least 2,000 years old. Uh, before this, the oldest complete Hebrew Bible we had is from A.D. 1,000. So this took us, took us back 1,000 years earlier in terms of... Now, in, in one case, like the book of Isaiah, we have almost a complete book of Isaiah that was found. Many other cases, we just have fragments. So we don't know how the whole book lived. Uh, whole, how the whole book lo what looked. Uh, but it gives us a sense of what Bibles were like 2,000 years ago, and it helps scholars then to reconstruct the history of the transmission of the biblical text. Uh, and it fills in little details here, here and there. Now, that's important for Jews. All these texts were Jewish texts. They weren't Christian texts. But, of course, the Old Testament books became part of the Christian canon, so Christians are very interested in that as well. Now, for Jewish people, um, they have a different, maybe a different significance because, well, they are part of their biblical text. Uh, but they also reflect other religious texts written at that time, 2,000 years ago. So we have additional prayers, additional hymns, additional rules and regulations of how people lived. Uh, and so it, it and uh, this is contemporaneous to the rise of Christianity and the rise of Judaism. So the same time that Jesus was up preaching in Galilee, these people were reading and studying these texts uh, at, at Qumran, which is pretty remarkable. I mean, we we know in the Gospels that Jesus went out, was baptized in the Jordan River, and he wandered in the wilderness. He could have easily gone to Qumran and he could have read some of these texts. So that's pretty amazing for many Christians. That is amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. How did you get interested in, in studying the Dead Sea Scrolls? At what point in your life did you say, this, this is what I want to dedicate my, my scholarly career to? I, I didn't anticipate that initially. I went to seminary, uh, and then I went to graduate school. I wanted to work with the Old Testament. Um, and I became more and more interested in learning the biblical languages so I could read them for myself, uh, and also interested in the origins of the Bible and how it was transmitted. Um, I, I didn't, when I went to Claremont Graduate School, I went to study under uh, Rolf Canaram, and my dissertation was food in the book of Psalms, mm. so it had really nothing to do with the Dead Sea Scrolls. But two of the professors that were at Claremont were very influential in my life. James Sanders, uh, who ended up uh, publishing, and this is one of his publications, he published the Dead Sea Scroll, the Psalm Scroll, and this is another piece of it. Oh, just a picture of it. I don't know if any, you can see that or not. But uh, So he published that. He was one of my teachers. Uh, and then, uh, so he spent time in Israel and the Albright Museum uh, publishing that text. Uh, and he was influential starting the Ancient Biblical Manuscript Center in Claremont, uh, which I was interested in briefly, but it turns out that they, they got a, a set of the photographs of the Dead Sea Scrolls, about 3,000 photographs, and they needed someone to catalog those. And I had just graduated and didn't have a job, and so it was an <laughs> opportunity. It was supposed to be just one year, 
uh, but it allowed me to go to Jerusalem for a year. And as a biblical scholar, I, want, I wanted to go to Jerusalem and spend time there. Uh, and so, and then Brownlee was another professor of mine, and he was actually at the Albright in 1946, 47, when those first scrolls were brought in. So there was quite of a history. Uh, so initially, I wasn't that interested, but I, and, and then once I, once I got through the, the one year, uh, I managed to stretch it to three years because there was a lot more work to be done than, than was anticipated. And, um, and I guess at that point, uh, I developed a kind of expertise working with the scrolls, and I was able to keep raising some questions about those topics. Okay. What does that work look like? Day, day in, day out, what were you, <laughs> what were you doing during that time? Um, well, uh, I was... I was I did several things. These are like some photographs. So there were about 3,000 photographs, and I went through uh, every photograph. There were some older lists, so I didn't start from scratch, uh, but they needed to be updated and revised. So there are about 3,000 photographs that needed to be updated. Um, and then I had to interact with the scholars who were publishing the materials as much as possible because they had identified particular documents. A lot of these had not yet been published. so. Uh, later on, they would be, and uh, uh, and then I also went to the Rockefeller Museum, and I worked with the actual fragments. So I did an inventory. There were about 1,300 glass plates, uh, and this is an, kind of an example of one of those photographs, and it's a, a little smaller version. They were about uh, the size of a piece of paper, uh, and this is an example of one that has lots of fragments on it. So some of the earlier photographs would have maybe up to a, a thousand, no, not a thousand, a hundred or so fragments were within them. So I went, kind of went back and forth between the photographs, the actual materials in the manuscript center, and then I worked with the editors as well. Okay, that's fascinating. <laughs> Absolutely fascinating. So when you you spent the fall of this year uh, in Norway at the University of Agder, uh, working with an international team of scholars from a variety of disciplines. What were what were they doing, and then how did your work tie into to what they were doing, and what other kinds of work did you do while you were there? Yeah, um, this is a group. Uh, they have a research group called the Lying Pen of Scribes there, and the way it works in Norway, there are research research funds available, but uh, groups of scholars need to put together proposals uh, and try to invite scholars from as many disciplines as possible. And so they work together in conferences and things. Um, so actually, I, I became acquainted with them a couple years ago uh, when they invited me to come over and give uh, lectures, a couple lectures to them. The reason they were interested, because I had written an article on the fine sites of the Dead Sea Scrolls back in 2007, and I raised questions because uh, a lot of this material was bought from Bedouin, and it was not found by archaeologists. And so part of the question is, do we really know where these fragments came from? Do we really know that they're authentic? Now, the reason this is important, because in the last 20 years, uh, a number of fragments have come on the market, supposedly at new Dead Sea Scroll fragments. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Bible Museum, for instance, in Washington, D.C., they bought some of these fragments. There's also a Norwegian scholar called Martin Schoyen in Norway that was buying up fragments. Um, now, the, the Bible Museum uh, had an analysis done by an independent investigation and came in and found out that these were all fakes. They were modern fakes, uh, which raises this question. So the group of scholars in Norway, and they worked also with Schoyen in his, his new text, mm -hmm. and they began to have doubts about those too. And so they're interested in the issue of provenance. By provenance, we're interested in how do we trace these texts back to their origins? Mm -hmm. Not so much where they were written, but how do we really know that they came from caves? Where did yeah. they come from? Uh, and some of the early scholars, unfortunately, I would say were not very careful because they did, they did archaeological work, but they didn't take pictures. And then they quickly mixed together what was bought from the Bedouin and, and the, what was excavated. So we don't have a clear provenance issue. Um, so I was raising a question 15 years ago uh, that suddenly becomes very prominent because now one really has to try to get the story straight about where fragments come from to make sure they're authentic. 
Um, so they were surprisingly interested in what the work I did. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and when it, what I produced, uh, this was what I produced, this little thin volume, the catalog <laughs> in 1994. Uh, obviously, it became out of date, but I thought, I, I think S Scholars Press said they only sold about 50 copies of this, <laughs> so it wasn't like a bestseller. But if you are a scholar, then, and you're inter interested in finding the fragments, then you need something like this. Yeah. But uh, Arston said, you know, you need to update that catalog. You're the best person to do it. And he says, we'll, we'll put it online uh, at the University of Agder. Okay. And so... I said, well, great. If someone's interested, I'm willing to do update it. Yeah. So to jump back in it, there were probably 20 more volumes of publications published since I did this. So then I could go back and identify precisely fragments and, and update material. And now there's an Israeli uh, scholars that are interested, and I've sent that out, that have come up with maps that they can put numbers on each of the fragments. Mm -hmm to help label those fragments. So I've always wanted to have maps, because I thought if you have a list of fragments, it doesn't help people find them. So, uh, so that's, why, that's why I was interested. And yeah, they were, they were interested in, and it's curious, I'm old enough, there is younger scholars, and they wanted to know, some of the early scholars like John Strugnell have died off, I mm -hmm. worked with those. So these young scholars were saying, what was it like to work with John Strugnell? <laughs> Did you meet Frank Cross? Yeah, I met yeah. met Frank. Yeah, so I so it's kind of fun to sh stare, you know, show uh, stories. And they are also quite interested in in how the early scholars were doing their work. So some of the interest now is what were they doing? How did they go about organizing the material? How did they piece these texts together? How did they interpret them? And it's all published now, but younger scholars are going back and and redoing all of this work. So to do that, they need to go back and like work through my old catalog, and work and work through some of the older materials. Okay. So, what do you what do you see as the big issues right now for for scholars who are interested in studying the Dead Sea Scrolls over the next ten to twenty years? You know, the junior scholars, the graduate students. What kind of work do you think they'll be doing to advance the study of the scrolls? Well, one of the things I think some of the modern scholars are interested in the physicality of these texts. Some of the early scholars were only interested in the text, and I think they want to analyze some of those physical features, um, and that's been something of my interest as well, uh, sort of rethinking some of that early work and rethinking uh, these scholars what we have now, in many ways, are reconstructed text. And so if you recognize their reconstructions, then you'd like to know how did they put these texts together? How did they put fragments together? Did they go together? And so kind of reexamining that whole process of uh, reconstructed and even reconstructed fragments. Um, and some of them are also interested in the kind of critical approach that was being used by scholars at that time. Uh, one, one scholar is working on a PhD. Uh, there are like 40 volumes in what is called the Discovery of the Judean Desert, and these are the publications of text. So he's interested in, in looking throughout those volumes and seeing what they did and did not say about text. They were interested in certain things and not others, and how do they go about reconstructing text and so I think they're interested in kind of thinking through the scholar, what the scholars have done okay. and, their, and their interest. I actually presented a paper on John Allegro was one of the early scholars. Uh, and in some ways, the stories about the scholars are as interesting as the text mm -hmm. because some of them were, were fa fairly eccentric. Uh, John Allegro was, and some of his later work is quite unusual. And, uh, and he, uh, he, for instance, was very interested in the Copper Scroll and uh, I have a picture of that. Uh, and this is, uh, it was actually made oh. out of copper. Uh, and uh, it's, it's green. It looks oxidized here because of the corrosion. Uh, and when they found it, it was one scroll, but it was broken into two pieces. Uh, they couldn't, they could only read the outside of it. They had to eventually send it to the University of Manchester where it was cut with a bandsaw in strips mm. so they could read it. But what it is, is it's a treasure map. 
it tells about large amounts of gold and silver that have been buried in certain places. Wow. Now the question is, is it a fictional treasure map or a real treasure map? Well, John Allegro thought it was a real treasure map. And he was out hunting to try to find the places where, and went out digging and looking for places. Wow. Others thought it was, it's still a contested issue. It's an unusual text. And the Hebrew is, is quite late. It's what we call almost Mishnaic Hebrew, which is a later form of Hebrew. Uh, but it was, this is, this is found in Cave 3 uh, at, at, at Qumran. So what in the world is this text? What were they doing? And it's also a bit cryptic. It has Greek symbols that are scattered throughout mm. the text. And they have kind of directions to places, but it's like it's by this mountain and this hill and this river. And, of course, how could you reconstruct that? Yeah. Some think it could be a reflection of the temple treasure. And, and it may have, if the Romans didn't find everything in A.D. 70, um, maybe this, this is a treasure mm -hmm. map of where all that was buried. No one's found yeah. anything yet, but so this is this was John Allegro. He was wow. out burying, you know, di out digging things. So <laughs> that's why he was a bit eccentric. His his daughter actually wrote a biography of okay. him, and it's quite interesting, actually. So um, these are kind of unusual characters. They were they're a very small group of scholars initially. Um, John Strugnell was one that I worked with. Unfortunately, he had an alcohol problem, and eventually was asked to leave, but he was, uh, so that was interesting, working under his supervision. But, uh, wow. I mean, it sounds uh, like Nicolas Cage has a project coming, oh, <laughs> coming oh, yeah. up to me. These, and the, some of the stories are not, have not been told, but there yeah. are some interesting <laughs> studies about these scholars. And so, yeah, I think the focus on the scholars interests these young, young scholars, so it's, yeah. You know, and so that's kind of fun to be able to. So I'm the old guy. I'm one of the survivors <laughs> that can talk about the early days. <laughs> oh. Well, how how does the work that you've done on on the Dead Sea Scrolls influence the teaching and the work that you do here at the University of Jamestown, and uh, play a role in in the education that our students receive? I think there's there's direct and maybe indirect uh, evidence. I think, you know, the fact that I spent a year in Jerusalem, uh, and while I was there, uh, it was like a, f a fourth time position, fourth, so I could do other things. And uh, I went on out on archaeological visits and things around the country and visited, and it's the land of the Bible, and I teach mm -hmm. the Bible a lot. So there's a lot of rich material that I gained in that process. Uh, and I'm, I'm interested in archaeology and artifacts and helping students to connect text with the ancient times. And I've often, I've always been interested in trying to help take students back into the past so that they understand the culture and the background uh, of these, these ancient texts. Uh, and I think the Bible is often misused by people who just take it out of that context and they have no awareness of that, that biblical world. Um, I think, and obviously the, the Dead Sea Scrolls have a direct effect in terms of the biblical texts are important in terms of understanding uh, the background of the Bible and its transmission. Uh, most of my students are not interested in all those details, but I like to remind them of things like these texts were written in Hebrew initially. Uh, they didn't have any vowels. And to help students realize that the Bibles they're reading today are part of a very long history. Uh, and so I try to show them. I will even show them pictures of Hebrew texts and say, what do you see? And mm -hmm. even though they don't know the language. So I, I think it's important that they have some sense uh, of, of the origins of the tradition. Um, and these are material artifacts that help us uh, better understand the text. Um, I think you know, living in Israel is, is a complicated place, Jerusalem, is a holy city for Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So I, I got exposed to different religious traditions. I teach world religions. So it was useful from that point of view to have a, a more of a perspective. Um, it's allowed me to uh, go other places in the world and interact with other scholars very much. It's an international enterprise. 
So I work with scholars from different countries. Um, there aren't probably a lot of people that work with the Dead Sea Scrolls, but um, they're, they're a small group, but they are scattered you know, around the world. Mm -hmm. So it gives me a, a much broader perspective, I think, on uh, the study of religion in different countries and different places. And I, I, I want to try to give my students that kind of international uh, exposure as well. Well, great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for, for sitting down and, and talking with me a little bit uh, today about the work that you've done with the Dead Sea Scrolls and really for the research that you've done to advance the academic community's understanding of, of what they are and their significance and for bringing some of that back to our students. Very happy to do that. Thank you.